Welcome to, to the second lecture of our lecture series entitled Encountering Madness, um, Intercultural and Decolonial Approaches to the Phenomenon of Mental Illness. This series has come about through the collaboration of the Vienna Society for Intercultural Philosophy, the Institute for Science and Art, and the Department of Philosophy at the University of Vienna. Um, as you have probably already read in the invitation, the purpose of this series is understood as an attempt to challenge the Western mainstream understanding of mental illness by giving voice to positions that have been suppressed in the global context. For indeed, the Western modern discourse uh, continues to present itself as a universal truth, yet intercultural and decolonial orientations um, expose precisely its provinciality by not only criticizing uh, the cultural conditionality of its epistemic presuppositions, but also by pointing to alternative approaches to understanding psychological suffering. Uh, having heard Kirsten Rütter's presentation last time on deconstructing the, co the concept of mental illness from a South African perspective, today we are happy to introduce our second speaker, Karim Mita. Uh, Karim Mita is a public health specialist with additional interest in religion, having studied Islam but also Arabic in Syria. Um, thus, he has an interdisciplinary and international academic background. His focus lies on psychology and health. Uh, he is teaching and researching in the UK at the Asher Institute and Edinburgh Medical School. His research teams employ sociological approaches to diversity and cross-cultural healthcare, or more specifically, issues of social exclusion, acculturation, experiences of care, especially among um, migrant and Muslim communities. I would like to thank you. Um, also on behalf of my colleagues for accepting on you, our invitation and being here today. And now I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Christina, and thank you um, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak with you all. Um, and thank you all for uh, making the time uh, this evening to attend this talk. Um, and hopefully it's engaging, and hopefully you learned something at the end of it. Um, so I'm just going to preface this by saying the, um, I understand, given that the topic, you've looked at various different cultural contexts of understanding how uh, mental health and illness can be construed. I think when we talk about Muslim communities, um, it's quite important to dis disentangle this element of what sort of religion and culture. So throughout the presentation, I will be discussing elements of how, what we see as more the theological approach versus the, the cultural element of it. Um, so there's a few areas that I want to discuss throughout this presentation. Um, I appreciate people come from different backgrounds and different contexts, so I'm just going to do a bit of a primer on some of these topics for you. Uh, and she's talking about Islam and Muslim communities, and then going into the debates regarding mental health and illness, which I think is going to be of interest to this audience. How do we construe concepts behind uh, what we label as madness, for example? Um, and then the theological dimensions of uh, conceptual, uh, Islamic conceptualizations of mental health and illness. Uh, I'll then talk about how these can be construed in Muslim communities. Uh, and then I'll talk about within um, any discipline, really, there are obviously debates and critiques. So I'll talk a little bit at, towards the end of my presentation as to the uh, challenges within the Muslim mental health sphere and what does that mean and what are the current uh, uh, discourses uh, being conducted there. Um, so to start by the very basic of, of what is Islam and what, of who are Muslims. So as you can see by the graph uh, um, on the right hand side, this shows the uh, across the world the proportion of population which are Muslim. Um, and uh, at the bottom you can see the various denominations uh, of Muslims um, around the world. So there is estimated that there are about 1.8 billion Muslims worldwide. Um, Islam literally means to submit, and it is said that um, the Islam comes from the um, the revelation to the Prophet Muhammad in 610 AD, um, and that's a lineage of straight from Adam, Moses, uh, Noah, uh, Jesus, um, within the Abrahamic tradition. Um, Muslims believe that uh, Muhammad was the last prophet, and they. Um, follow the, the Quran, which is a holy book, um, and I'll go into how the different denominations uh, as well as some a bit of their theological um, underpinnings. But uh, there are two major uh, sort of splits, denomination sects, if you call them that. Um, about 85 to 90 percent are Sunni, they're the mainstream branch. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent um, 
are, are Shia. And so the differences therein primarily lie amongst um, who is the um, holder and leader of the community following the death of the Prophet. Um, often Muslims are, tend to be racialized or assumed to be Arab when actually only 20% of Muslims live in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, Two-thirds of the Muslim population globally live in, um, in Asia, so countries, for example, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, there's um, uh, dominantly more Muslims there. Um, there are differences um, in the various um, fiqh or jurisprudence um, or schools of thought. Um, there are the four major schools of thought in the Sunni tradition and the two in the Shia uh, tradition. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the details, it's not necessary for this presentation, but just to show you uh, the concepts of as much as we want to think that Islam is a monolith, there's actually great heterogeneity um, in there. We can see by the theological underpinnings as well as the cultural backgrounds. Um, the major pillars of faith, again, we may be familiar with this concept of the pillars of Islam. So within the Sunni tradition, there's the five pillars of the Shahada, which is a declaration that there's no God but God, and that Muhammad is a messenger of God. Um, so, so fasting, we're familiar with Muslims fasting Ramadan, uh, zakat, uh, charity, salat, prayers, praying five times a day, and hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, the Shia tradition, the, the two branches, one is the Ismail Shari branch, which um, is predominantly in Iran, um, and they have their uh, pillars of faith as well, again, uh, following this idea of leadership. So the imams, um, the leader of the community, uh, they believe that there's a succession of imams, so coming straight from the prophet who designated his um, cousin and son-in-law, Ali, to be the leader of the community, and that is divine ordination or nas. Um, and so there's a, gen um, a genealogical lineage of imams within the Shia tradition. Um, within the Ismaili tradition, there is a a other pillars of faith as well. Um, I think notably your eyes may be drawn to the term jihad. This can be uh, con contentious, but essentially what jihad means in this context is a struggle of uh, living, um, trying to be true to the practice of the faith, uh, that balance between the din and the dunya, the worldly and the spiritual, of essentially trying to be a, a better Muslim. So you can see how within the uh, various uh, denominations are uh, different pillars. Um, what overarchingly we have as the guiding principles, again with variations and um, recognizing the differences within the Shia tradition, um, are the main um, guiding principles, if you will. So the Quran being the holy book, which was um, uh, sent to uh, the Prophet by God, um, the Hadith, which are sayings of the Prophet during his time, which were then later uh, collected by his companions, uh, the Sunnah, which is basically the traditions or behaviors or the customs <coughs> of the Prophet. Um, it is common that many Muslims uh, believe that following the Sunnah is quite important. So um, the way that, for example, they in interact, the way that um, you turn, um, if you, the way you're being buried, for example, you have to follow certain traditions, and that's following this sunnah. Um, and what's important to recognize is that Islam is, uh, like any world religion really, is seen as a way of life. So like any religion, it has its um, guidance in terms of way of interacting with each other and the world. So the way you interact with the opposite sex, uh, clothing, modesty, your dress, having halal, permissible and haram, which is forbidden types of foods or behaviors, um, even things like uh, taking banking, so how interest is pro um, prohibited, uh, rules around uh, inheritance, etc. So you can see that there are uh, different principles which, which guide the way of being around the world. Um, in Austria, it's estimated there's about 750,000 Muslims, which comprise about 8% of the population. Uh, Two-thirds are estimated to be Turkish, and given the, uh, that Sunni Islam is, is the main denomination in, in Turkey, it's, it's perhaps unsurprising that two-thirds of Muslims in Austria are Sunni. Around 40% of Muslims in Austria live in Vienna. Um, interestingly, I was reading that there's a bit of controversy um, regarding um, I think they call it the Islam map, where they're trying to locate where different mosques were in Austria. And I think it shows that there are, within any country there can be politically, political dimensions uh, to how Islam and Muslims are viewed. So the fact that in, in the UK context, I wouldn't necessarily see having a map where mosques are located to be controversial, but it is in this context. So I think that informs you how um, the politics can come into play.
Um, so that's a bit of an introduction regarding Islam and Muslims, again, to re-emphasize that we have Islam, which is the faith, and Muslims, which are the people. Um, so I'm now going to go into a bit about mental health and illness, I think, which is what people here are quite interested in. So obviously we've got the biopsychosocial model, um, which the global mental health movement um, from, so, from Brick from Patel's um, from, uh, propagating and promoting that viewpoint of the global mental health movement and the biopsychosocial framework, saying that there is an interaction between the biological, psychological, and social. So this is where we see that interaction between um, you know, neurochemistry, between uh, brain, um, different parts of the brain, so saying the hippocampus and its involvement in uh, depression, you've got uh, the amygdala prefrontal cortex. Uh, people are saying that there may be genetic basis, so doing genome-wide association studies, trying to look at the genetic basis of these, which again, if you think about it, can be a bit controversial by saying different mental illnesses are genetically uh, inherited. Um, and then recognizing that, again, within the psychological landscape, of the, the nature nurture debate, how even if someone has a predisposition to something, they may not actually develop that later on in life. It could be an environmental factor, an environmental stressor which can cause it. So again, recognizing the social context. So is it people may experience adversity, austerity, deprivation. Um, I'll go into racism a bit later on in this talk. Um, again, the psychological um, at the individual level, what is their self-esteem? Their, how were they raised at birth? Do they have good attachment? So you can see how these principles interact within the biopsychosocial framework. Um, now, that's not to say it's been accepted. I think that this series shows that this can be quite contentious and people have different frameworks. So we've got um, critical psychiatry. Um, so Joanna Moncrief's um, group at the University College London um, shows that there are debates within this, the psychiatric uh, landscape regarding this um, mental illness, uh, what we label as mental health, mental illness. Uh, Thomas Saz, Ivan Illick from the 1960s, from the anti-psychiatry standpoint, talking about there's a myth how you can often, is it about pathologizing different people's behavior? Is there an aberrant, is there a normal, is there an other? Are we pathologizing normative responses to stress? Um, what is the role of psychopharmacology? Uh, the British Psychological Society, for example, and was it last year, the year before, published a series on depression. What do we know about it? Talking about is it environmental uh, related? Is it socially caused? Um, are we, uh, and I think that's a bit understandable given the, the debates regarding are antidepressants um, useful? Are they a placebo effect? Do SSRIs work? Do uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors work? W what exactly is the, the mechanism? And a lot of that is unknown. Um, there's also the cultural relativism angle, uh, which then considers, again, it, are these processes universal? Are there cultural frameworks in understanding mental health and illness? Um, what is the role of folk and lay models? So Lipsitch and Little Wood and Dean Alexander and Nibir have looked at um, Bangladeshi communities in East London, and they've looked at the way that um, people construe using faith healing. And again, you can look at it in other cultural contexts. Other religious groups use faith healing as well. Um, <coughs> Again, it looks at how do you see the world. Um, critical psychology um, looks at how the social context can influence psychology, so understanding that there is a role of we don't exist in a vacuum, we exist in a so, uh, specific context in which there are social processes at play, that there's a power, that groups can be marginalized. Um, so how are, you know, during COVID pandemic, when everybody's in the lockdown, we've seen that rates of um, depression and anxiety have, have increased. Now, critical psychologists would be like, is that an aberrant behavior? Is that a normal response to social isolation, the fact we couldn't see? friends, families for two years, you know, naturally people may feel that they're lonely and isolated is life worth living. So it's looking at how are these psychological processes um, at play within a specific context. Uh, do we consider, you know, marginalization, socioeconomic status, um, uh, racism, all these factors can uh, influence the way we view uh, different psychologies. Um, cultural psychiatry is, is uh, as it says, a branch of psychiatry, and it, adds, it looks at how culture can play a role in experiencing distress. So looking at cultural models, explanatory frameworks, the ways of coping. Um, it is a multidisciplinary area, which it, it takes its um, genesis from medical anthropology, looking at public health. Uh, it considers the role of social and environmental processes. Um, and I think what's interesting is that there are debates within the psychiatric landscape as to look, what is the role that cultural psychiatry has. 
given that we think of psychology as a discipline, psychiatry as a discipline as something that's very clinical, uh, observation, you can observe natural phenomena, where do things like um, culture and religion and spirituality come to play? Are these, these things may not necessarily be measurable, but they inform how people live their lives. So does that have a role to play in the way we uh, deal with uh, different mental illnesses? Um, and what cultural psychiatry does is it recognizes there is this, this hegemonic view in diagnosing and interpreting uh, mental illness. Um, cultural psychology, again, similarly looks at the role of culture and how that influences uh, psychology. It recognizes that there's an interaction between people and culture. Um, and what it does is problematizes this uh, the, these conclusions or these universalisms that we see. So a lot of the time in psychology literature, you'll see findings that are come from what we call weird uh, populations. Not that they're weird, but they're, it's the acronym of being Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So primarily from the Euro-American context. And it says, well, are these findings um, applicable to uh, uh, different societies across the globe? So we know that there are differences between individualism and collectivist cultures, and these can have an influence in the way that we um, uh, interpret events, the way we develop attachments, the way we construe um, different social phenomena. So it argues that we need to consider cultural vari variability as well. Um, and so just briefly, what is culture? Because I've talked about it a lot already. Um, Hughes' definition is just that it is a socially transmitted system of ideas that shapes behaviors, categorizes perceptions. Um, it's widely shared by members of a society or social group, uh, functions as an organizational framework. So inherent in these terms is this idea of a social group, that there's a community, that there's an implicit agreement that this community functions this way, that we believe in these terms, that we have a certain um, ideas and values and norms and then this is agreed upon and it's recognizing that this forms within this group and that's not necessarily a universal approach. Um, culture and mental health um, is quite important because essentially culture, like I've talked about, can influence how you view the world and by definition and an extension, how do you interpret uh, a mental health disorder. So different cultural groups have different um, values on the way that they cope, so whether there are prohibitions, for example, in Islam, there are prohibitions against suicide. Um, and early in the 2000s, there was some literature in, in the British context which said that um, South Asian communities had higher rates of, South Asian women particularly had higher rates of suicide. But when you unpack that, you saw there was differences by religious groups. So that was, that was found primarily in uh, Hindu and Sikh women. And the Muslim women, again, due to prohibitions against suicide, that actually was lower than expected. Um, Islam also um, forbids consumption of alcohol. There are differences around, around gender interactions, etc. Um, culture can influence how we talk about illness, looking at the metaphors of distress. It influences what we call a locus of control. So does that mean that we have internal agency? Does that mean that we have a, you know, a belief that we are the masters of our own destiny, that we cause things to happen? Or is that, uh, do you believe in fatalism, which believes that um, everything is sort of preordained, that what happens is God's will, that we don't necessarily have um, a, a choice, we, we have individual agency, but God ultimately is the operator and makes things happen in our lives. So that can influence whether or not we uh, go to see the doctor uh, for a simple like, thing like that, or even how do we interpret an event happening. Um, if you look at the relationship between religion, culture, and mental health, um, several studies have shown that increased religious involvement has been positively associated with greater psychological well-being and lower levels of depression. Um, in the Muslim um, community, in the Muslim context, uh, Ghazal Amir found that positive religious coping was associated with reduced levels of depression, um, and religious practices can provide strategies that promote hope and resilience. Um, and one, of, uh, one study that I did in Australia looked at Australian Muslims, and they said that their religion was something that to have faith in gives them hope. So we can see that even within religion and culture, there's this element of personalness, their connection to their faith, but also a community aspect. So the fact that they are engaging in a practice that they have nothing else to turn to gives them hope and meaning. Um, so when we consider cultural views, we can see that uh, one aspect of that is the lay framework and approaches. So whether we view that in terms of the Gale and the model, for example, looking at the humors, or do we consider that in terms of witches and spirit possession? Um, social construction, so how people have with mental health, um, health, ill health conditions, mental illnesses have been negatively um, 
portrayed throughout history. Um, in the eugenics, they call them having, having feeble-mindedness. Um, and some uh, current explanatory models is that it could be seen as a test from God or people are possessed. So that, uh, so that sort of talks about religion and culture. Um, if you look at the various different uh, areas within psychology, so we've got liberation psychology, which understands the psychology of the marginalized and oppressed. So it recognizes that, we, that people don't exist within a vacuum, that there's a specific context that occurs, and then we have to examine the interconnectedness interconnect of self-culture and community. Uh, it recognizes that there are social inequalities at play, um, that social justice plays an important role. So you can see within different marginalized groups, so you've got the LGBT community, the black community, having their elements of so black psychology, queer psychology, etc., trying to look at how do we unpack this idea of, uh, of power that's sort of coming down and uh, sort of pathologizing <coughs> different behaviors and experiences. Um, similarly, you have decolonial psychology, which recognizes that psychology reflects inherent racist colonial structures. So we can argue whether that, um, you know, psychometric testing, that IQ tests, you know, this idea of what is an average IQ, what is intelligence, um, that, can, and, um, that shows inherent racist structures, for example, through eugenics, phrenology, you know, being seen as dismissed um, without sort of used to determine differences between different races. Um, and it's the colonial psychology looks at how structural violence is used to assert hegemonic knowledge and pathologizes essentially this non-weird or the other population. Um, it recognizes we need to have empowerment and participatory action. Um, and Che et al. has added to this model by looking at, well, if you look at sort of the biopsychosocial model, if you look at the uh, social phenomenon, how do we then take experiences of race and racism? So we can look at racism within a societal context, whether there's institutional racism, uh, the personal experiences of racism, and the internalization of racism, so experiencing of self-esteem, self-advocacy, what impact does that have? And he, promotes, he proposes this a model of uh, embedding racism within the biopsychosocial framework. So you can see how uh, things like microaggressions, uh, discrimination can impact people's psychological risk and, and behaviors. Um, and I think that's quite important to contextualize because what I've done is to show how these elements of cultural frameworks play a role in people's experiences, how there's different elements of psychology or psychologies, and how does that um, constitute within people's understanding and why it's important uh, to recognize that. Um, so if you look at Islam specifically, we can see within the tradition there are different frameworks um, of, um, which is quite important to, uh, to go over. I won't go into all these terms just now, but just um, to go through some of them. So this idea of Akidah, the, the creed, of uh, looking at fiqh, which is the jurisprudence, talking about what is permissible or forbidden, so halal or haram. Um, hijama I put here because it was seen as sunnah, so the Prophet um, used to practice uh, cupping. Um, there are various clinics uh, which is sort of seen in complementary alternative medicine, so cupping is seen as a uh, sunnah practice, so, so many Muslims may engage in uh, cupping. Um, and then if you look at sort of the theological dimensions and so looking at Rema, which is, you know, mercy of God is merciful, um, Shifa, which is the idea that there's a cure, uh, Dolba, which is repentance, uh, Tazikya, which is purification, and the idea of there being a Muslim Um Specifically in relation to mental health, we can see that there are specific uh, Islamic terms and concepts which relate to the experience of mental illness. So the idea of doing zikr, which is uh, recitations or remembrances of God, uh, doing dua or istikara, which is seeking out supplications or prayers for guidance. If you have a major event, uh, a major decision to be made, should you take this job, should you marry that person, you can take out istikara. Um, having iman or faith. Um, having sabr, uh, which you'll see this time and again when Muslims talk about their experiences of mental distress. It's about having just, just almost like a grin and bear it um, approach, having sabr, just have patience, you'll get on with it, you'll get through it. Um, have tawakkul, which is your trust in God, so just God has a plan for you, trust in this faith. Um, and having taqwa, which is God consciousness. Um, 
if within the theological text we can see there's elements of coping with mental illness there through the idea of coping, so the idea that within every difficulty there's relief. And this, um, again, within the ayat, we see that on no soul do we place a burden greater than it can bear. So when people read this, there is a recognition that there must be uh, an outcome, that this, this experience that you have is not going to be forever, that uh, God wouldn't put a, something on you that you couldn't deal with. So almost being seen that it can be a test, uh, a test of personal uh, faith, a test of personal resilience. Um, so often within these, um, through these ayats, we can see that's how people might construe their experience. Um, again, the concept of patience. So it says within this ayat, um, those who have faith take recourse to patience and prayer. So sabar and salat, uh, Allah is with the, the patient. Um, we shall test you and those who will, uh, we will give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere. So there's again this element of uh, people will be tested, they'll encounter difficulties in life, but have patience and trust in God and that he will see you through it essentially. Um, within the, uh, again, we, we see another ayat that says, have, uh, seek help in patience and prayer. Um, and again, this idea of how do we treat the mentally unwell is to provide for them, clothe them, and speak kind and just words to them. So this is quite important because it, uh, this ayat essentially gives um, sort of the justification of ways that uh, people in the past may have helped those who have mental health conditions um, in, in the past, and whereas right now culturally we can see that there are people who have negative portrayals, um, that people may be stigmatized for that, but actually theologically speaking it says that we should provide for them, give them respect, treat them with kindness, etc. Um, give them kindness, etc. Uh, within the Hadith, um, we can see this concept of Shifa, that there is a cure, that there is no disease that Allah has created, except uh, he, that He has also created His treatment. And the idea of personal agency and resilience. So the hadith saying that um, the Prophet said that there were, he saw a Bedouin leaving his camel out at night. Uh, the Prophet asked, why did you tie your camel? The Bedouin said, well, I put my faith in God. Um, the Prophet says, well, you should tie your camel first and then put your faith in God. So essentially saying that people have their own ownership and agency and they have individual responsibility as well and then God will help you. Um, so if you look at, again, within the theological concepts of how do we view this idea of selfhood and um, spirit and uh, the psyche, so we can see that there are four elements at play. We've got the aql, which is intellect or reasoning, the ruh, which is the soul, the qalb, which is the heart, and the nafs, which is the self. Um, and what exactly is the nafs? Um, it is the Islamic concept of the self, and it says that there is a relationship between the jism and the ruh, which is the body and the spirit. Um, and so this model, uh, I appreciate, is very uh, a bit clunky and it, it is debatable whether we can actually overlay these Islamic concepts onto this Freudian analogy, but, but many people have tried and it's almost like a rudimentary approach of looking at things. It's not, not necessarily the best fit, but I guess for, for comparability we can use this analogy of saying that there's the Anas al Amara, which is this, uh, the basic element of, of instinct, it's animalistic temptation, um, so you can overlay that to the concept of the id. Um, and there's the Nafs al Awama, which enables reasoning of intellect, of looking at self-reflection, which again, you can consider that to be the ego, and the Nafs al Mutmayna, which is the process of inner peace, tranquility, and self-actualization. So I, this, this process that you go from the nafs al amara to the nafs al to so going from the animalistic basal, being not be able to control oneself, going on instinct to self-actualization, um, that's the process that ideally one, one would want to attain. Um, and so Sufism, which I'll get to in a bit, it, it, just fought, it takes us forward essentially saying that to attain enlightenment, um, you have to go beyond the nafs al amara, which is the lustful soul, uh, to the nafs al mu'mayna, which is to achieve self-actualization. Uh, the Islamic concept of the self is that um, the fitra or human nature, um, this idea of original sin doesn't exist within the Islamic tradition. It means that people are innately good. But what happens is that through the process of ghafla or forgetting, uh, people are amenable to Satan and through that they commit um, sins and through the influence of nafs al -amara. And that this idea of being sinful is through spiritual and mental weakness. So essentially, we, in order to not be sinful, we need to strengthen our, our soul, strengthen our nafs. Um, and the akal and the kalb are help to modulate that influence of the nafs al -amar. Um, sort of a visualization that Rothman and Coyle produced was, is this idea of how do you go from the dunya 
um, which is the worldly, to the din, which is the spiritual, to the akira, to the hereafter, with Allah. So you go from this, con uh, this, um, this base where you have the nafs and you have the nafs al amara al which is being um, influenced by, by sin, so committing sinful acts, the mudika, and then you have the kalb and the akal, which help to not modulate that um, element of the nafs. So through the principles of being, the sulul din, the tatib al akhlaq. Um, and then so you get into being saved, the munjiyat, and you have the nafs mu'ayna. Um, essentially, that, that process of moving from one layer to the next, of trying to uh, go through that process from gafla to, to essentially uh, attaining your natural instinct, which is the, your fitra, which is to be good, and going back to Allah. Um, we can see within um, historical Islamic approaches to health, so remember I showed this Quranic ayat which says for people who are experiencing mental illness we should care for them, clothe for them, etc. So you could see that within the um, sort of medieval Islamic tradition um, they used a model which was sort of the Galenic theory of, of medicine at the time where different humors were said to influence um, different um, conditions, so whether you're anxiety, um, whether you are melancholic, uh, for example, you have, there's an imbalance between the humors there. Um, Ibn Sina wrote about uh, in his Kitab al Shifa, looking between reasoning and mental health, looking temperaments to mental ill health. Um, al Baqi talked about the differences between al Dib al Ruhani, which is spiritual and psychological medicine, Dib al Qalb, which is uh, mental medicine. Um, and he looked at what we could consider now to be rudimentary cognitive um, therapy, so talking to people and trying to understand the root of their experience. Um, he classified depression or husband into three elements, which are which is everyday sadness, you know, the kind of sadness we, we could experience on a day to day level, so something that's innate or endogenous, which is um, prenatal factors which could precipitate distress or something that could happen due to an external event. Um, and at the same time, we also had this um, development of the Bimari stance, which literally means place of the sick. Um, and in that, we have uh, evidence of looking at different therapies. Um, I've used the image here of people playing music because currently it's interesting how there are debates about whether music is permissible within Islam or not. Um, some will argue that because of it, um, it may have a power to ignite the nafs al-amara, so ignite the, the basic instincts, animalistic behavior, lustfulness, etc. So, and there are debates as to whether or not is it, can you have music with um, instruments can have words etc so but i think if we look historically we can see that's quite interesting this is because music therapy was seen as a means of helping to calm people to relieve them of, of their uh, symptoms um so we uh, music therapy was used um at that time uh, similarly they used things like hijama because we know that sunnah um they used also aromatherapy rudimentary elements of psychotherapy uh, and chaining as well in, in some contexts so you can see there's a plurality of um um, different types of modalities being used during that time. Uh, I mentioned Sufism earlier, and um, what Sufism is, it doesn't necessarily neatly sit with this, this distinction between Sunni and uh, Shia, it is essentially Islamic mysticism, Gnosticism, and it says that in order to uh, attain the truth or the haqiqa, uh, we need to know knowledge of that, so knowledge of the Bhakti, which is the hidden world. Um, the aim is essentially the annihilation of the selfhood which is with God, so this idea of fana fiala, uh, of losing oneself, being one with God. Um, and we can see that Sufi practices vary across the world, so you may be familiar with the whirling dervishes, for example. Um, there's also elements of Sufism within various other traditions, so within the Nizari Ismaili Shia community of lit liturgical practices, for example, uh, doing zikr and bangi, etc. Um, he, he, with Sufism, you want to move on from the nafs al amar, so being uh, rid of that lustful soul, the animalistic instinct, going to self actualization with the nafs al mumayna. Um, you can perform a zikr in a private space or in a community with this to the majalis, and essentially through that, almost like if you look at it from a sort of a psychotherapeutic context, or you have your therapist which, gu which guides you. Similarly, within the Sufi principle, you have the peer, the master, who helps um, his devotees or the muris uh, through that process, and the murid essentially will uh, pledge his allegiance or baya uh, to the peer to take spiritual guidance from him. Um, 
again, to get home this message that if there is uh, heterogeneity within the Muslim tradition, uh, Sufism is also controversial because some um, may say that it is beta or innovative. We didn't necessarily have that during the time of the Prophet. So this is something that is permissible within Islam or not. The fact that you're using um, a human being as a peer, as an intercessor, the fact that obviously in this picture you see dance, that zikr can be performed with music. So you can see how some elements can be controversial. Um, within the Sufism and mental health context, again, this idea of having a holistic approach to health. Um, nowadays, we talk about mindfulness and meditation as being important to having mental well-being. Um, you can see within the, the Sufi tradition of having zikr and fikr, that can be analogous to meditation and mindfulness. Um, going beyond the now and the body of trying to attain this self-actualization, beyond this to go into fanafila of having um, uh, you know, connecting this to God and seeing that, well, this disconnect could be due to, uh, so this madness could be due to having a disconnect from God because you're far from God, so that can uh, lead you to be astray and you can be uh, essentially mentally unwell. Um, we see in different communities the performance of zikr and bangi can impact mental well-being. So I think that's um, a bit of overview regarding the theological landscape of mental uh, health uh, through the Islamic side of things. And I think I want to go more into now about looking how it's construed within sort of the Muslims are recognizing how, how people, how the culture influences things. Um, so we look when we consider in Muslim communities, again, the importance of having cultural frameworks, cultural understanding, um, how that can impact people's conceptualization. So the idea of ayn or another, so the evil eye, you'll hear this uh, very commonly that if something has happened to someone, some ex someone experienced a negative event, um, that someone has put nazar on them. Uh, wiswas, which is whisperings, or seher, which is magic or black magic. Um, these are very cultural dimensions which people believe can influence um, or cause mental illness. Um, this idea of cultural relativism, again, recognizing that psychology and psychiatry didn't have at its core religion or spirituality. People may view this as having a Western construct, that it's not applicable to Muslims because it's devoid of anything that had to do with religion and spirituality. Um, people may feel that um, there's a theological dimension, so uh, people may have be mental, uh, mentally ill because they're having a weak iman, so weak faith. This could be due to fatalism or having a God's will. Um, and, or, and to seek help, people will then turn to folk healers to rid them of jinn, so jinns do exist within the Quran. Um, this idea of spirit possession does exist. So people will turn to folk healers to perform rukia, which is just incantations of the Quran. Um, so they go to these folk healers, they charge, people charge money to, uh, to essentially rid someone through exorcism in a way, of, through folk healing and rukia. Um, and so you can see how, how these cultural dimensions can play a role in people's experiences of mental illness. Um, and there's a recognition that because Islam is practiced in different cultural settings, um, there's an element of syncretism, which is sort of the, the enmeshing of religion and culture. Um, increasingly in diasporic communities, there is debate between generations by saying what is Islam, what is culture. So what, say, a first gen uh, generation, what parents or grandparents generation who move to a specific context may feel that actually that's Islam. The younger generation, millennials, Gen, gen Z, uh, people who, who migrate to uh, or sort of born in a new country may feel that actually their identity is to be more Islamic, um, that what they see their parents practice is not necessarily that's culturally influenced. Um, so there is, there is a debate being had right now as to what, what is purely authentic Islam and what is Islam seen in, in the cultural lens. Um, we can see that in, in several studies they've shown that um, using Islamic terms for cultural practice essentially makes them permissible. So whether or not a folk healer is using terms like rukia or jinn or dawis or um, as, as saying that these have an Islamic dimension essentially makes them more acceptable, whereas people at the outset may say, well, folk healer isn't necessarily Islamic, so we shouldn't do that. Um, within these cultural dimensions, we can see these labels being used of pagal, of majnoon, um, of hasad, there's envy, um, the element of black magic, um, fatalism, like I mentioned, having an external local control, feeling that the experience is due to um, a test from God uh, of not being religious, having weak faith. Um, in these examples, you can see how um, 
I'll just go down a bit. So Hijama in London. So that organization, um, it's just an example. There are many, many different uh, faith, uh, faith healers, folk healers, Hijama practitioners um, who practice the element of exorcism, of uh, tackling jinn possession, of getting rid of black magic, evil eye, etc. Um, in this picture, um, in the middle, you can see here someone who's experiencing schizophrenia, um, a psychotic episode, and the um, faith healer at the time is reciting passages of the Quran, performing Rukia. Uh, and again, in the above picture, going to folk, uh, faith and folk healers um, for spiritual healing um, uh, in terms of that, that cultural dimension. Um, and so you may ask, well then, what, why are people going to the folk healers rather than the allopathic or the conventional mainstream medical practitioners? And I think there's a combination of factors w which um, um, are influenced and uh, are said to influence that. So if you look at, say, in the British context, we can see that Pakistani women have um, high rates of common mental disorders, so high rates of depression, high rates of anxiety. Uh, generally, people from Muslim backgrounds have present to the, I guess, the NHS with uh, a later stage of their condition with greater severity. Uh, they generally have poor health overall, but we need to uh, recognize this can't be divorced from the social landscape. So a lot of times Muslims live, are more deprived, they experience substantial health inequalities. Um, generally the Muslim uh, population in the UK, for example, 50% are under 25, they have higher parity, so number of children. Um, if you look at referral rates and outcomes from mainstream NHS providers of um, sort of cognitive behavioral therapy, which the NHS gives, um, Muslims have the lowest um, recovery rate, so this could suggest that something isn't really working, mainstream CBT isn't working for the population when you have 40%, all, only 40% of, of Muslims who engage in this actually recover compared to 60% uh, percent of, so of the white British population. So it should suggest that um, it's maybe not be a, um, working for that community. Um, there's a substantial use of traditional medicine, there is a strong distrust of mainstream um, medical services and this could be due to experiences of uh, almost pejoratively being labeled as Mrs. BB syndrome that people go to the GP complaining of non-specific aches and pains, the back hurts, they've got a headache, they feel tired, they can't sleep. Um, we may recognize increasingly this to be a symptoms of depression but often for people of Muslim backgrounds there's an the element of well we're not going to talk about our mental health because that's stigmatized and taboo so we'll express these through what we term somatization or expressing mental distress through bodily sensations through physical illness um, there's a uh, fear that people may experience racism and discrimination within these spaces um, that cultural practices may be labeled and pathologized as otherized and if you go to the, uh, there's a perception that if you go to the GP and you, go, if you think that someone's putting those on you, I, I, is, that, is that someone going to actually understand what you mean? So the fear that there's a cultural disconnect as well. Uh, within the community itself, and this can be a bit controversial, uh, but I think it's important to talk about. Um, I've put this um, uh, image on, on the right side. Uh, in Urdu it says, lo kya kehenge, which essentially translates as, what will people think? And this is a big, big barrier within addressing mental health issues within the Muslim communities, um, because it is there are there are collectivist communities. The idea that something happens to you or your your actions reflect not only on yourself but on your family. So, if for example someone has a mental illness um, within the family, it seems to be heavily stigmatized because it affects the marital prospects of someone else in that family. So say, if you have a mental health condition, your brother or sister will not be able to get married if people find out. If you're experiencing depression or anxiety or, or OCD or eating disorder, again, this is going to impact, look bad upon your, your parents. What kind of parents are they? They raise you poorly to have this. Or maybe God is punishing you. Or people may think that they've done something um, that someone else in their family, so they've done something to displease God, so someone else in their family has now experiencing mental illness. Um, so there's also an element of, is that it's really important, so having cultural honor, um, saving face in the community, community reputation being very paramount. Um, there's also um, this idea of policing behavior. So like I mentioned earlier, certain behaviors are not seen as Islamically permissible. So whether or not you, um, for example, if you um, are, have a substance misuse, so alcohol is forbidden in Islam, yet people do have alcohol addictions. Um, sex outside marriage is forbidden, but if people have a pornography addiction, can they go to someone of their own community, uh, GPN, to, to, to talk about this? So that we've seen as culturally stigmatized or taboo. Um, 
sex outside marriage if someone is experiencing a problem with their relationship or is pregnant and they're not married, that can have a big problematic implications within the community. So people may feel judged within their own, um, by their own providers. <coughs> uh, there's also very gender dimensions as well. So um, I, I, using toxic masculinity, I appreciate it is controversial, uh, but there's almost this uh, double standard between men and women. Men can do things, um, so it's almost acceptable for men to have girlfriends, whereas women should not. Uh, should, should be virgins before marriage, etc. Um, and women are sort of assigned to the domestic sphere. This idea of problems between the wife and the mother-in-law is almost seen as an open secret. There is almost expected to enter a marriage and have uh, problems. So you can see that because of these cultural dimensions that can affect people's well-being. Uh, we also can't forget the fact that there are wider determinants of place. So obviously Finsbury Park, where there is the attack uh, happening against Muslims praying. Um, we've got the English Defence League saying about the burqa, so examples of the cultural context of how uh, the framework in which Muslims are living sort of heightens their sensitivity, heightens their experiences of sort of feeling belonging, heightens their um, elements of, you know, uh, self-efficacy, essentially, if the culture uh, environment in which you're living in says that you don't belong, how is that going to impact your sense of well-being? So experiences of culture clash, the uh, fact that social mobility is a very much a challenge. If you look at the migratory history, history particularly in the UK, Muslim communities moved in, um, to, uh, helping the labour force after the Second World War, working in manual labour tech jobs, this, for example in mills, when those were closed uh, due to industrialisation in the 90s, a, a substantive unemployment. So you have groups of people who are living in deprivation, um, seen as working class. You have within their tab British tabloid press portraying Muslim men as rapists, gang rapists, um, sex addicts, etc. So you can see why there are problems um, with essentially being socially vilified as a group. Um, prevent strategies. So um, within schools, so if someone says that they're going to the mosque, is that going to bring, bring alarm bells amongst teachers by saying this person is being radicalized or not? So essentially being told that they don't belong within a community. Um, and I put this slide purposefully because you may be thinking, well, what does racism have to do with mental health? Why is he even talking about this? Um, it is, it, we see this actually within many minority communities. So if you remember I talked about earlier, liberation psychology, decolonial psychology, how different groups have their experiences and cultures, so black psychology, queer psychology. Um, there are several studies which looked at whether, say, if you're African American, Latino, a Maori in New Zealand, the, the very um, experience of marginalization can lead to poor psychological well-being, higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety. Um, for Muslims, um, we know that religious identity is very, very salient. It's almost the primary identity many have. Um, and almost paradoxically, uh, it's seen in very different, very different communities as well. Like I said, African American, Latino, ex Maori, uh, having a strong, um, essentially, you're reclaiming this identity. So it's, if it's something that you feel your community has been very marginalized and oppressed um, by mainstream society, it's almost like you look at that as a sense of identity, sense of resilience, sense of um, uh, protectiveness, essentially. Um, and so that's the rejection identification hypothesis. Um, intersectionality obviously plays a big role if you consider the idea of deprivation, which I mentioned earlier. Deprivation uh, overlaid with race, overlaid with ethnicity, overlaid with religion. So you're experiencing marginalization on multiple fronts. Um, there was a study that was done by Kateli and colleagues in 2013, and it was done in, in the US and the UK. And they found amongst UK respondents, they basically asked people to rank where they thought different population groups were, how evolved they were on a, a set to man scale. And um, in, in the US, they said Arabs were less involved, evolved, and in the, UK, in the UK, they were saying Muslims were less evolved. So you can see how the social context essentially vilifies a population, um, and this can add up to with the psychological terms of weathering, aesthetic load, and minority stress theory. Uh, again, we can see clear evidence of this, obviously. I know, I know we're in Europe right now, so the impacts of Brexit, what does that happen in the UK was primarily, again, you can argue whether it's economic, but uh, for many it was seen almost as based on race terms. This idea of, oh no, if you let Turkish, Turkish are Muslim, if you let the Muslims, they come in, they'll invade the country, we won't recognize Britain. That was a big argument the Leave um, campaign used. Um, Theresa May, the former prime minister, sending out vans in ethnic high density areas saying, are you illegal if you are, go home. Um, so essentially pro problematizing a population. Um, and we can see how the impacts uh, of labeling 
can have on people's sense of well-being because these these bands were essentially heavily targeted in ethnic areas um, and we can see how in certain contexts this is a comic but says your head scarf is not uh, appropriate in our office yet other people are wearing similar scarves as well so why does it having on your head versus your shoulders really matter um, so if you look at the community perspective of mental illness we can see there's a generational divide so I mentioned a bit earlier that because of the increasing uh, I guess acceptability of talking about mental health these days, we can see there is a generational divide that young people are wanting to talk about this more, whereas older generations will still say that's a stigma, don't talk about it, it's going to affect our, is it going to affect our social standing. Um, still there's an element of sense of failure that is a test of God, that, that their iman isn't strong enough, that there's a reason that they're um, experiencing this. Uh, familial reputation matters. Um, the impact of religiosity, you're experiencing this because you don't go to the mosque more, because you're not praying every day, etc. So almost feeling judged by the community. Um, and there's a, a preference to turn to family members, religious leaders, and faith healers rather than the uh, mainstream medical practitioners. Um, I'm going to spend a bit of time on this slide because I think it's quite important because it says that if people how are certain practices construed? So if we were to say that people are experiencing mental health difficulties in different ways and they cope in certain ways, but how are their coping strategies um, being considered? So if you say in a therapeutic context, if someone says, well, I am um, experiencing depression, but one of the things that, that keeps me going and gives me faith it, it is um, my faith and that I, I pray more and I, I go to the mosque and I feel a sense of community belonging. Now is that faith-based coping or is someone going to pick that up as being radicalized? Oh, the person is actually increasing markers of religiosity, so that's a radicalized term. Um, the very elements through ritualistic practice of ablution, so before you pray, you go through the, pro the process of wudu, so cleaning your hands, cleaning your feet, cleaning your face, cleaning your ears. And now, is that seen as ritualistic? Now, if you do that five times a day, now is that seen as a ritual or is that seen as obsessive and compulsive behavior, the fact that you're doing these patterns so frequently? And if you miss out on doing your wudu, how, what impact is it going to have on you? Um, people, there is an element of uh, ethnic minority communities moving to ethnic, what we call ethnic enclaves. Now, think about it from a migrant perspective. Are you going to go somewhere where if you've seen these vans saying go home, you don't belong, are you going to go somewhere where there's other people like you? So you feel a sense of community, so you feel a sense of belongingness. But how is that framed in the press? That's framed as ethnic ghettos, that people are not integrating, that they're being insular. Um, if you talk about uh, sort of religious discourse, so do, am I going to pathologize someone else for their behavior? So we know that in certain ethnic communities, um, so uh, that there's elements of racism in, in a psychological diagnosis. So in, in the UK, if you're black, you're nine times more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. If you're a black child, you're more likely to be diagnosed with conduct disorder if you're, um, or oppositional defined disorder just for misbehaving. You'll see increased rates of Asian and Pakistani children being diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. Again, look at what are these concepts and diagnostic criteria that you're using. Um, so terms for, if you ask someone their, their how religious are you? So some, some scales may say things like, how oh well does this person, how often does that person go to the place of worship? Now, in Islam, not all Muslim communities, not all mosques are available for women to go to. So you can all already say, oh well, that woman doesn't go to the mosque, she's not religious. Well, actually, that's not true, because religiosity can be practiced in different ways. Um, and again, and I, sorry, again, this distinction between religious or religiosity versus social group membership. So increasingly, you know, there's a tendency to homogenize Muslims, but actually these days we see people can feel culturally Muslim just because they're part of a community, that, that, that's their heritage, that, that's their background, that's their, where their parents are from. So this idea of being culturally Muslim, um, even though they may not go to the mosque, they may not pray, they may not um, fast, etc. Um, and what, what the tricky part is, it, when you're talking about a group that's been marginalized and you're saying that um, the, the danger in having some of these epidemiological studies of saying, well, we've got prevalence rates of X, Y, and Z, is that there is a challenge of saying, well, that's something innate, that, that oh, this happens because, of, because they're Muslim, rather than recognizing that, you know, mental health illnesses can occur in different contexts, amongst different communities, amongst different social economic statuses. Um, by saying, but instead it will be framed as, oh, that is, um, it's because they're Muslim, uh, they're experiencing mental health, ill health because they're Muslim. So you can even see some academics going down that line. For example, Fauna and Alba says that religious markers of identity impede inclusion. 
you have uh, Goddard claiming that being Muslim is a hindrance to mental health. So you can see how different academics have already started to use the narrative of this sort of race and mental illness by saying something's innate rather than recognizing the social processes or explanatory frameworks, etc. Um, and so you can understand then why there is challenges in, in using mental health services. So as I mentioned, Muslims are least likely to use, are more likely to use religious coping, less likely to use mainstream services. Um, there are, like I said, 43% of Muslims actually recover when they go actually, when they access mainstream cognitive behavioral therapy through the NHS. And th there's an argument as to whether or not that is it because it's Eurocentric, individualistic, does that work for collective cultures? Um, what is the impact of acculturation? So a paper I'm currently revising um, suggests that may factor in. Um, we look at, and if you look at generational differences, Abraham and Woodley suggest there are generational differences as well. Um, and there was a study by Schnitker which looked across Europe and he looked at different religious groups and he found that Muslims have the highest rates of depression in Europe, but he found that actually religious identity moderated that. So what he meant by that was saying, yes, they would have high rates of depression, but actually the rates would be even more higher if they didn't have a strong identity or social group ascription. So again, considering this social identity approach to um, health and illness. Um, I appreciate I might be out of time, so I've just got a few more, a few more slides, sorry, uh, Christina, so it'll be the last few, I promise. Um, looking at the inter-community workshops, so we now know that there are many community wellness workshops uh, because of the lack of the epidemiological evidence base, the community, particularly in the UK, has taken upon itself to try to find out what is the nature of the problem. So they run community-based surveys. Now you can talk about are these representative, they're cross-sectional surveys, Do they are they standardized, are they valid? Um, but what they found is the people who, who've co completed those surveys, 50% of respondents noted depression and anxiety, 30% said they had suicide ideation. Now remember I said suicide is forbidden in Islam, so now you've got 30% of their sample size was 1,000, uh, so 30% of that say they have a suicide ideation. This shows that there's, there's issues which are not being addressed because of cultural shame and stigma. Um, there are courses uh, on Islamic counseling and psychotherapy. Um, there's the International Association of Islamic uh, Psychology, um, the Revivalist Islam, is a, uh, Revivalist Islam, and there are debates as to um, are we Islamicizing psychology or are we psychologi psychologizing Islam? So what that means is, does psychology fit for us or should we find something else? Or actually psychology does fit, but let's use these terms um, let's try to Islamize it a bit by using analogous terms like I talked about between the id ego and super ego. We talk about the various elements of the nuts in that, so trying to find ways we can connect the two. So that's the debate that's currently being had. Um, regarding the narrative of Muslim mental health, so who, who talks about it? I think it's quite interesting. In the, the US, they have the Muslim Mental Health Lab by Rania Awad, which has started to look at embedding uh, mental illness within sort of the health, the medical paradigm. Um, but that's not the case in the UK. So in the UK, it often ends up being seen as sort of a niche area-based study. So we won't necessarily see this work in psychology, sociology, or, or uh, medicine. We'll see it more in Islamic studies. So you'll get PhDs uh, being done in Islamic studies, which look at men Muslim mental health. So you can argue, is that appropriate or not? Um, there are controversies even regarding Islamophobia. So some academics will say Islamophobia doesn't even exist. It's not a thing. Um, again, recognizing the intra-community nature, but you've got now you've got so many different organizations claiming they're doing Islamic psychology. Who has the authority? Who has the knowledge? Um, in an area of radicalization, where is the funding for this work coming from? Is it because they want to prove that innateness or that racism element within Muslim mental health? Um, and so the challenge is, this is the bit, the last slide, which again, when we consider Muslim mental health, it's recognizing the difference between Islam and Muslims, look, recognizing the syncretic elements around it, recognizing the importance of religious identity, the impact of acculturation, generational status, um, and recognizing there is Islam as a culture versus Islam as a practice. So recognizing there are groups, you know, feminist Muslims, LGBT Muslims, Muslims who are cultural Muslims, and who identify as Muslim but yet, yet may not fit that element of religiosity. So then do you tell someone who may fit those groups of Muslims that just pray more when that's not necessarily the, the framework in which they're coming from? Um, and then again, assuming that people believe that it's due to jinn or Ayn al-Hasad or Sarah when it's not necessarily the case. So I think that's a really broad overview. It's a bit of a complex overview, and I appreciate you guys for bearing with it. And um, I can see some really good engagement, so I wonder if you guys have any questions. I appreciate that's a lot um, to go through. So, uh, but yeah, thank you for your time.
Yeah, thank you for your very complex and interdisciplinary presentation. Uh, it was really interesting. And now um, I think we have some, yeah, we have like 20 minutes left for discussions and questions. So if you have some, feel free to ask. That's a lot. <laughs> so, so it's a bit of a broad overview, but I think with the, the interdisciplinary angle, which I think is quite important, because I think when you look at how um, mental health is construed, even within a sort of a medical paradigm, do you consider the anthropological, the social, the cultural, um, if you consider from a theological standpoint, but then you're neglecting sort of the, the social and the psychological as well. So I thought it's quite important to recognize just as people, um, you live within a specific social context and the ways that your your um, the ways of being and your interpretation of your faith is very much patterned and determined by your social context and your relationships. So that's sort of the that's why I took the approach yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah, I would maybe like to ask about the, the individualization of mental problems. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I'm not quite sure like, I mean, the English uh, discussion is different. We can talk about race yeah. more um, openly because it's historically not that, um, that heavy as it is in, in the German discourse. You know, we cannot, for us, it's almost forbidden to talk about uh, race as, as a homogenic idea because of the, uh, fascism mm -hmm. and national socialism. And I think it's, it has also the needs why there is a, more, where we are more, more, um, uh, how to say, yeah, whatsoever. What I just want to say is that when you talk about Muslims, mm -hmm. are you taking it really in the, in the English discussion as a race? Mm -hmm. Because then you are talking about Afro Americans mm -hmm. and you are mm -hmm. talking Africans, but yes. Muslims are not really also the English discussion. You would maybe say German would say it's not really a culture or a nation. Mm -hmm. It's it's a religion like you can have it in Africa, you can have it everywhere. So that would be uh, one one question. And the other about individualization is in many non-European cultures mm -hmm. and also religions, you don't have the idea so much as a, of an individual. Mm -hmm. And maybe there we have the, the biggest conflict between modern Western psychiatry, psychotherapy, which will always try to to see you as an individual which is isolate, can be isolated somehow mm -hmm. in its habit, in its uh, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's not that culturalized the position as they have it, let's say, Arabic Islam, African Islam, and, or, or Far Eastern Islam, mm -hmm. like Pakistan. So. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll start with the, with the order you asked, and if I miss something, please feel free to ask me again. Um, I think it, it's, I, I think you, you've addressed some really important points there, and I think that this idea of the innateness, and I think when we talk about things like phrenology, psychology of science, you're trying to measure intelligence levels, and I think you can see how that can be problematized. Um, the fact that if you're saying, like I said, um, how things can be construed as being innate. So the moment you talk about differences by race, difference by ethnicity, differences between groups, you're almost like you're pathologizing them, which can explain why you have comments by saying, well, it's because they're Muslim, this is why they're experiencing X, Y, and Z. I also recognize the point, I didn't get to make this in the talk, so I'm glad you, you, you brought it up, that yes, there are different Muslim communities, and the fact that, yes, in this country, we've got a lot of, um, it's, uh, like I said, two thirds uh, may be Turkish, but that's, that's important because if someone comes in from Nigeria and they're Muslim, are they necessarily going to fit within the Muslim community here? They have that affinity of, yes, they're, they're, they're Muslim, but the cultural dimensions at play and the way that things can be practiced can mean that that person may not necessarily fit in, even though they're, they're Muslim. So I think that's, a, that's an important point as well. In, in the UK, um, that racialization um, it is quite important because in the US, obviously, we've got the racialization of Muslim equals Arab. In the UK context, we've got that idea of um, Muslim equals South Asian because, uh, again, the, the, the migratory history of people came from South Asia, from Pakistan, uh, from India, 
And that is sort of the mainstream's exposure towards Muslims. So essentially what you see in, in the discourse is basically, like I mentioned earlier, that the idea of like um, negative uh, perceptions or portrayals that you see in the tabloid media are essentially um, religionized as much as you can see the racialized. They're religionized, so someone from a particular group essentially is seen as a, as a Muslim problem. So I think that, that you're right, the cultural context does matter. Um, and I think it's interesting being in, in Vienna, the European context of how, how you see Muslims here. Like for me, as I mentioned, the fact you, that having a map of the mosques was seen as controversial to me, I don't see why that would be. But again, that I can understand the different political and um, cultural context in, in which you d here deal with issues of race and religion. I think even in France, you can you can't ask about ethnicity, can you, on the census? So it shows how different countries approach things differently. Um, your second point about um, individualization, uh, I think that that's quite important. And I think this is where, um, particularly in the UK context where I'm from, um, whether or not the psychology and psychiatry and psychotherapy fit for Muslims, because that, that idea of having that, that self as an individual versus self as a community, the fact if you feel that you're going somewhere, is your behavior going to impact on someone else? You're right, these are very individualistic approaches. So let's look at you, let's, let's put the problem as your family, let's put the problem as something you've done when someone, if they feel that, well, no, this is just a test from God, I need to overcome it, you can see there might be tensions between the therapist and the client by saying, well, actually, then what are you going to do about this? Because you're just saying, as everything is just a test, everything is God's will, why are you here? So uh, I think you can see why things may be contentious and, and that uh, tricky in, in that landscape. And also looking at, do you treat like uh, people as a collective by looking at, well, if you say, well, um, I guess from an American Western standpoint, it's just easy to say, well, just if, if you're experiencing this issue, just remove yourself from the circumstance, remove yourself from the problem. Where is that necessarily the case in, in a collectivist culture in which you have issues of this other phase of having that social standing? So it's, it, I think you're right. It, that, that is why people from different cultural backgrounds may feel that um, that certain approaches may not be working for them because they're not recognizing that the, the cultural context, how easy it is for you uh, to say to remove yourself from an envi environment if you're experiencing abuse, for example. And it's not very easy. So I, th I think that, that those are really good points that you made. So thank you for that. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I also have a question. Okay, so I just uh, asked my question uh, because I think this bad anxiety dichotomy is pretty strong in Islam, and I just wanted to ask: uh, is there is there anything like maybe in the Sufism or so um, discussing how the body is affected from for, from suffering, or um, is mental suffering always like in all in all Islamic traditions viewed as? being only mental or is there also something about the body um yeah so so you're asking is there something to do with yeah is suffering essentially just just in the mind or is that can you yeah. get like physical health conditions as yeah, well like if yeah. this dichotomy between mental and yeah. body yeah illnesses. it doesn't it this is so much so i said yes yeah, so you see so you will see things like for example people have got um, diabetes or they're experiencing you know cancer that that discourse is still used that's saying that's something that that feel, people feel that they've done something to to have this physical illness that this idea of um, they must have done something bad or just again everything is just a test of whether you're just going through uh, cancer or you have um, you know a, a condition a, um, Huntington's or something like that, that that's again all these things are viewed within that similar way that maybe that because they've sinned in the past that they, this is why they're suffering now so that that relationship that, that sort of that reason of experiencing any type of illness whether that's physical or mental has that, that similar um, explanatory framework okay. thank you can we ask something more and you were just talking about this whole Islamic idea of uh, mental illness as something negative, as we also discuss it in Western, uh, in Western ideas that somebody is um, suffering and somebody is uh, having problems or something like that. But you have also in Islam, especially in Tasawwuf, the idea of holy madness, mm -hmm. like somebody is. Um, 
it's madness. It's not. It's, it's a test. S still, it's a test. But it's it's a kind of madness which which does not uh, want anymore to fit into social order, mm -hmm. to social uh, ideas, and which which one uh, which is trying to break out in order to show the truth, the narrative uh, uh, of your own being. So. Did you also research about this idea of holy madness or madness as a kind of uh, epistemic critic or even like even as a political action? Like you know, like mostly political action is also a kind of madness in the sense of that it is disturbing the order, it is disturbing what should, what is normal, what is a healthy life. I guess we have it now with the climate protest and somebody's uh, putting his hand with glue somewhere. Yeah. And it's kind of, I mean, if you see from a mental point of view, you could maybe even say it's, it's mad what, what the person is doing. But you see, I just I just try to, to highlight uh, is there in Islam also this kind of progressive or emancipatory forms of madness or so called mental illness? I think this, that that is a really interesting point that you made. So I appreciate that in in the the talk that I've done, I've I sort of used that that Western um, psychological psychiatric standpoint of looking at mental illness as something that that is negative. So I appreciate that. So that's sort of the paradigm. I think the challenge is often we're very influenced by the paradigms in which we work in. So if if we're looking at sort of uh, mental health versus mental illness, so if you're thinking something is sort of aberrant, how do you deal with sort of the coping of something that is seen as suffering? So that's again that I appreciate that's the perspective I, I've used. Um, and as to your point as to are there examples of uh, where someone who demonstrates sort of aberrant behavior, or they could be like signposted by God. Now, I think th that's a bit controversial in Islam because uh, essentially, the um, officially anyone who like, the only person who could have received revelations from God is is is, is the the prophet. So essentially, that, that's that's the final message. Whether people or not have been influenced by God, then yes, you do. You see within um, different cultural contexts where people feel that they have been divinely inspired, and maybe we would label them to be as mad because some people say, "Well, how can you be divinely inspired? Because that's not Islamic or not religious." Well, they have um, gained some movements and tractions um, from that perspective. Are people are there holy men um, in various Muslim contexts? Yes, of course there are. There are people who, who, like I said, you could look at the peer, for example, as being a knowledgeable, divinely inspired person or holy. Man, um, so but then other Muslims will feel that actually that's not Islamic. So you can see that um, it, it's very tricky to answer, like for all Muslims, because within these different cultural contexts, and in South Asia where we've got like the peers and the dargahs and people do shrine vi visitations um, to uh, get healings and blessings from someone they feel as how as was touched and influenced by God. So going to the shrine is going to be beneficial to them. Is that, that happens, these are Muslims who do that, but other, other Muslims will say, well, that, that, that's sacrilegious, you can't do that, that's not Islamic, that's heretical. So, you, so it's, it's difficult to answer that, but I think, um, yes, I, I think within uh, historically and culturally, th there will be examples where people will feel that you could see being mentally ill as actually, um, or mad or unconventional as, as a positive thing. Um, but th that I appreciate that's not the dimension I've looked at. So I, 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 for me, that's definitely, uh, I can look into that more because it, I, even from what you said, that sounds interesting and, and that's an interesting avenue. Other questions? <laughs> Okay, we have... Um, I have a lot of... <laughs> <laughs> you can have time for me with that, which is fine. We can, we can have a conversation after yeah. this. Yeah, so you, it's very interesting. you have time for one more question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the other question would be a very difficult one for, maybe for you not, but for me at least, the, because madness and illness comes, and it was also kind of topic of this lecture series, it comes always with a binarity or dichotomy with you have madness on the one side, you have normality mm -hmm. on the other side, you have mm, healthy, sick, you know, you have always these dualities, and, and I would like to ask, do you, do you have that in Islam as well, like, I mean, or could you even say 
from a from a tasaruf point, like this is all mad, you know. That they, I mean, this whole existence of human mm -hmm. is is a kind of madness, anyways. Mm -hmm. And the question is how to come out of this madness. So not that the as we think in Western life, normal is one who goes to the world, does everything properly, yeah. does no mistakes, and you know, and and is correct in many many ways. And this is, but. Maybe from a test of point, that would be also mad, you know, because it's a, it's a waste of life just yeah. living that way. You know? So I really would like to ask you this: what what is normal, or what, what is you know what is the epistemic framework of reality, normality, and uh, something like that, that? That's that's something people will argue a lot of the time. So if if within the Sufi tradition you've got the, the, the fakirs, you've got people who will be ascetic, sort of distance themselves from the physical life because for them it's like, why, why am I here? This is dunya, this is gafla, what, what am I doing here? There's no point. What is, what is the point is to be to the concept of fanafila, of being true to God. So maybe, and they will be seen as mad because they're abandoning the, the physical world um, and people will say, well, you can't abandon the physical world because you live in it. So how do you remove yourself from that situation? Whereas you know, the, the fakir will say, well, actually, this world is madness. So I, I really like uh, that, new fact, that, that, that direction you took because um, that it, you'll see like Sufi poetry, you'll see uh, Sufi um, songs being written, uh, people will, will have these stories and it, it, if you go through this, you know, poets like, like Rumi will you talk about, well, what is the point of this? The, the only point is this, uh, like, this reality is meaningless, it has nothing to do, the only reality is truth and that's the, the, the hakika with, with, uh, with God. So then you can see how um, for them, this world is madness. So again, I like that element that you said. This, the, the, who, who's defining what what mad is, and whose terms is defining normality? And I think that goes back to again this a theme throughout this lecture series is that if we take this sort of your American Western biomedical construct of like this is how things should be, everything else like what do you mean someone doesn't want to work? Someone doesn't want to go through the idea of the rat race, wake up every day six, six to six and work and come home. And for us that's normal. For some people they go, what's the point of that? I'm gonna remove myself from this situation. Again, I think this point that you made of um, protest, I think that's quite important because uh, for me that's Personally, I would say that is an element of interacting within society. But again, that's why we need to consider the social and political context. So if you've got, um, like in, in the UK, it, it, it's a bit of a, a contentious point right now where they're trying to make uh, protests illegal. Um, there's some, the Home Secretary is trying to um, make some laws and it, it's caused a lot of issue because freedom of association, freedom to express an opinion. But as soon as the state gets involved with sort of regulating what is normative behavior, then you can get into really problems. And as you alluded to earlier, this um, element of like fascism can creep into it because we're saying you're not, not normal, you're aberrant and therefore you shouldn't be here. And, yeah, so we get on a slippery slope, but I think essentially what we're asking is who defines madness, how, how do we define normal, and what are elements of subjective experience, and are these things uh, sort of part and parcel of the human experience, and I think what we're finding throughout this series is that actually, you know, this question of how do we um, uh, interpret different events, and how do we interpret uh, feelings of... Um, you know, both pathos, you know, essentially, and that can be different towards different cultures, and I think that that's a really interesting and insightful thing that I think you're trying to do um, in your series, so that that's really commendable. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you for coming today. Um, yeah, so if there is no urgent question, we will end. This session uh, on this table you can find um, the journal Polylog. It's like um, it's like being a part of the Vienna project for intercultural philosophy. Um, so please take a look if you want to, and you can also buy some some uh, journals if you want. Uh, you can also find there the the program with the next lectures. The next one will be on 30th November. Um, and it will be about Tibetan notions of subtle body and its implication for the treatment of me mental illness. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, thank you, Karim, again for coming and for your interesting presentation and thank you all for attending this. Yeah. Thank you.